Thinking aloud. Conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. This is part one of a three-part series on integral yoga, the philosophy of Sri Aurobindo. With me is Dr. Debashish Banerjee, who is the author of Seven Quartets of Becoming, a transformative yoga psychology based on the diaries of Sri Aurobindo. He is the all also the author of a book about his great-grandfather, The Alternative Nation of Abin Abinendranath Tagore, and a book about his great-uncle, Rabindranath Tagore, in the 21st century. In addition, Dr. Banerjee is the academic dean at the University of Philosophical Research in Los Angeles and an adjunct faculty member at Pasadena City College and the California Institute of Integral Studies. Welcome, Debashish. Thank you, Jeffrey. It's a pleasure to be with you. It's always a pleasure. When we think about the philosophy of Aurobindo and the yoga of Aurobindo, I suppose it's important to recognize that, on the one hand, many of our viewers may not be familiar with him, and on the other hand, he's one of the most influential writers and thinkers in uh, the Vedantic yoga tradition of the 20th century. Indeed, indeed. So let's let's begin by talking a little bit about his life. Sure. He uh, began his work at a very fertile time, uh, right around yes. the turn of, of the century, a, right. a time when I, I think it's fair to say revolutionary changes were taking place around the world. Quite true, quite true. And India was colonized at that time. It mm -hmm. was colonized by the British uh, and uh, Quite a large number of uh, nations were colonized at that time. Mm -hmm. And I th I'd say it, it might be fair to say that the first half of the 20th century saw quite a large number of decolonization movements mm -hmm. and new national governments appearing. So Sri Aurobindo was born uh, in 1872. And uh, he came from the city of Calcutta, which was the, uh, the capital of the British. And um, his father, as a number of other Indians at that time who became educated, uh, was part of a kind of a segment of society mm -hmm. that uh, uh, valued British education, uh, the values uh, of the Enlightenment, mm -hmm. and uh, the Enlightenment meaning the Western, the Western in Enlightenment, 18th yes. century yeah. ideas of Enlightenment, of, of the Enlightenment, yeah, uh -huh. the, the, the European Enlightenment, mm -hmm. which um, is very different from the yeah. notion of an of, of Enlightenment in yoga, for yes. example. Yes, mm -hmm. so. Uh, it's, that, that fact is also very interesting because the term uh, enlightenment used for the Buddha, for example, mm -hmm. is a, a kind of a carryover of the term enlightenment uh, in the European enlightenment mm -hmm. used to define a different kind of uh, oriental enlightenment. Mm -hmm. But his father um, felt that his sons should not be exposed to Indian culture because he valued the superiority of, of British culture. Mm -hmm. And so he sent his sons to England to be educated when they were very young. Mm -hmm. And uh, Aurobindo spent uh, his uh, entire young adulthood, his school years and his early college years in, in England. Um, he gave express, his father gave express instructions to his host mm -hmm. in England not to let his children come into contact with any Indians. Mm -hmm. So he had very little connection with India except for the mm -hmm. letters that went back and forth. Well, it sounds as if from what you're saying, there's almost a certain amount of self-hatred of Indian culture. Yes, there. yes. Yeah. So this, this class uh, that arose due to 
uh, interactions with the British, particularly in the city of Calcutta, mm -hmm. uh, a class of native elites that learned the ways of the West so that they could uh, become tr middlemen mm -hmm. uh, in the British commercial enterprises, mm -hmm. they naturally rose to a certain uh, kind of elite status uh, within the city. And uh, they had a number of attitudes. Many of them uh, began to feel that this was a superior culture. Uh, the British culture was a superior mm -hmm. culture. And they felt, as you say, self-hatred or hatred towards their native culture. Mm -hmm. uh, some others um, felt the opposite. They felt that uh, they needed to embrace their own culture and deny mm -hmm. Western culture. And then there was another attitude where they tried to rethink uh, both cultures mm -hmm. because of the clash, uh, mm -hmm. the, or what, what you could call a clash of civilizations. Well, and, and at the same time, at time, Western culture is going through incredible change. You have huge movements in the arts, in psychology, Absolutely, in yes. science, yes. in politics yes. going on at that time. Exactly, yes, mm -hmm. yes. So Aurobindo grew up in that kind of ferment, but in England, only towards the end of his day, he started becoming more conscious of the fact of India being colonized. Mm -hmm. um, so he went to Cambridge University. He was a very brilliant scholar. He was a scholar in the classics, mm -hmm. which meant he had a very deep grounding in Greek and Latin uh, language and literature. Mm -hmm. And he also read all the European uh, continental languages. He, he read uh, French fluently, mm -hmm. uh, German, uh, Italian, uh, even some Russian. Mm -hmm. And uh, so he came back to India in 1893. And uh, by that time, he was very conscious of this, anti this uh, colonial uh, uh, occupation of India. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, he felt that the values of the Enlightenment, which primarily had to do with uh, uh, the equality of all human beings, yes. uh, was something that the British themselves were not holding up. They were kind of uh, talking the talk, but not walking the walk. Mm -hmm. And so part of his effort when he came back to India was to launch uh, an anti-colonial movement uh, movement of he was one of the early founders of Indian nationalism. And in effect, he became what we might think of as a political revolutionary. A political revolutionary, mm -hmm. and uh, so he, he was um, pitching for Indian political freedom. At that time, there was a little bit of a political movement, but those um, natives who wanted uh, some concessions from the British didn't. Worked. They didn't have enough daring to ask for freedom, mm -hmm. independence. So they felt that they wanted uh, constitutional changes so that the British gave uh, more rights to mm -hmm. the Indians mm -hmm. and they were not as oppressed yes. as they were at that time. Uh, but Aurobindo uh, was looking for more than that. He wanted complete independence. He was one of the first to de uh, ask for complete demand, complete independence. Mm -hmm. And his grounds were not only the fact that uh, Indians were being oppressed or looked down upon by the British, uh, which violated the enlightenment norm of the equality of all humans, yes. but the fact that all humans had the right of self-expression and a people that had a cultural history of their own needed the independent right to uh, explore their own future. Mm -hmm. So self-determination, both political and cultural, is what he was demanding. And for that, he felt there shouldn't be another power uh, colonizing uh, the nation. From our perspective, since mm -hmm. uh, India has been independent now for uh, nearly 70 years, Yes. years, that seems like a very normal uh, thing to ask for. But at, at the time, I guess he was viewed as uh, probably something close to a, a traitor. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And uh, Aurobindo's uh, uh, attempt, political attempt, uh, included two directions. Uh, for the c common people, he was uh, asking uh, for, 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 for Indians to be uh, 
uh, to use passive resistance, mm -hmm. which is what Gandhi made very big later. Yes. Uh, passive resistance, boycott of foreign goods, mm -hmm. uh, creation of indigenous industries, mm -hmm. Swadeshi and indi indigenous cottage industries, mm -hmm. as well, if, if possible, of, of uh, machine-based industries. Uh, so that was one side. And the other side, for those who were willing to give up their lives for the nation, he was trying to build an army. Mm -hmm. So he was thinking about insurrection. Mm -hmm. So we can see that there was a non-violent and a violent approach that were both simultaneously mm -hmm. being carried out. And I, I suppose it's fair to say that at that point, the British regarded him as more than just a revolutionary, but as a terrorist. As a terrorist, exactly. And in the, in the, in the missives that went from the governor general to the authorities in England, he was named as the most dangerous man in India. This is the man who later was to write a great classic called The Life Divine. Yes, right, right. Uh -huh. A spiritual classic, classic of peace, you may mm -hmm. say. Yeah. And he was imprisoned. So he was imprisoned, um, I think, in 1908, 1909, uh, th that time period for one year. Uh, because they were trying to, uh, there was a bomb incident mm -hmm. uh, in which some of his followers, uh, without his express permission, uh, tried to uh, kill somebody mm -hmm. and ended up killing two English ladies. Mm. Um, and it was a mess. Uh, all those people were captured and Aurobindo was also hauled into prison and uh, waited for a one year period. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and the, one of the kind of interesting to, to kind of quirks of fate is that the judge uh, in his case mm -hmm. uh, was actually a classmate of his in Cambridge and uh, went for the ICS exams, with Indian civil service exams, mm -hmm. along with him. I see. Uh, he may not have known him personally, may not have been a friend, mm -hmm. but he knew he, about him. Yes. And some people say he was really lucky mm -hmm. with the same kind of evidence. If he had a bad judge, he could have gone to the gallows, mm -hmm. but he was let free for lack of uh, sufficient evidence. Let free after a year? After a year, yeah. yes. But I'm under the impression that during that year in prison, he had some profound experiences, not so different perhaps from the prison experiences of uh, Malcolm X, who had a religious conversion of sorts. Yes, it's interesting that a number of such figures, often revolutionaries, mm -hmm. had uh, spiritual changes in the, in the prison. Mm -hmm. And uh, in his case, yes, a year before he went to the prison, he uh, started his spiritual practice, his yoga practice, uh, with a guru. And uh, in a very short time, he himself was surprised at uh, the spiritual experience that came to him. Mm -hmm. uh, it was the experience of the unreality of the world. And he uh, spoke about it later, where uh, he felt that his, his thoughts stopped, his mind became silent, and whatever he we take to be real uh, as what comes to us through our senses, or uh, perceived by him as mm -hmm. shadows. Mm -hmm. So the whole material world seemed to become insubstantial. Is th this akin to the uh, Sanskrit concept of Maya? It is, mm -hmm. exactly. It is the concept of Maya, the, the knowledge of the world being a projection of Maya, and uh, the sense of a permanent consciousness behind and as if whatever we are seeing, the three-dimensional world we experience mm -hmm. is actually happening on a flat screen mm -hmm. and is a projection mm -hmm. from some other power of reality. Uh, perhaps a higher dimension. From another dimension, right, exactly. Mm -hmm. It's projected onto a screen from, mm -hmm. a, say, a fourth dimension. If and you when you say a projection of Maya, at, at this point, Maya is also a goddess. Maya is also a goddess, and he was to grapple with this issue of, because later he says that the experience didn't completely satisfy him. He lived in that experience for a long time. He was supposed to give a political speech the day after he had that experience. And his teacher, 
was actually also connected with the political circles. Mm -hmm. a, a lot of yogis were part of the Indian freedom movement at that time. Mm -hmm. So uh, the teacher said, you must go and give your speech. And he said, I've lost my motivation. Mm. I, I don't see any reality uh, in, in, in what I thought was real. Mm -hmm. So the teacher said, uh, no, this is just a passing phase. You, you have to go and give that speech. And uh, he said, you fold your hands to God, Narayana. Narayana is a name of Vishnu. Mm -hmm. And the teacher was a follower of Vishnu. So the teacher said, fold your hands to Narayana and the divine will speak. Uh, it sounds very similar to Krishna telling Arjuna to go into battle yeah. in the Bhagavad Gita. It's similar, <laughs> you're quite right, Jeffrey. So he in fact said, I don't even have the motivation to fold my hands to Narayana. And this man said, nevertheless, you go up on the stage, I will fold my hands to Narayana and the speech will come out of your mouth. <laughs> And he uh, records the fact that he did as was told. And as he was walking up, his eyes fell on a newspaper. And uh, whatever was the content of the newspaper he came into his mind. Mm -hmm. And when he stood uh, at the podium, he observed himself giving a speech. And the speech was based on what he saw in the newspaper. But he was not actually constructing it. It was being delivered. Ch it was channeling. He was channeling it, mm -hmm. yes. So uh, he lived in that condition for almost a year. This is before his imprisonment. Before his imprisonment. Uh -huh. And th the culmination of that period was when he was imprisoned. And he's written a wonderful, uh, you know, little pamphlet mm -hmm. called uh, Tales of Prison Life. Oh, I see. Where he talks about the fact that uh, he'd been receiving some uh, messages uh, that he needed to take a break from politics and concentrate on his inner life, but he couldn't. He he was too attached to he, it, he, too engaged, too attached, and at the same time experiencing extraordinary states of consciousness right. and potentially some paranormal experiences. Right, a highly educated man with a curiosity yes. to explore these things. Uh, more seriously and already under the tutelage of, of a real yogi. Right. So he, in the prison, uh, it's, a, it's as if a number of new dimensions were opened up for him. Mm -hmm. And there he had, he claims, two other very major experiences which uh, supplemented that first experience. Mm -hmm. So this maya that we are talking about, that he then started seeing that this world of projected forms was not unreal, but that this maya, this power of, the creative power of, of whatever higher dimension we're mm -hmm. talking about, actually was uh, formulating itself as everything there was. Mm -hmm. So everything was really a, a kind of a vibrational mode of, of that uh, divine power, the shakti that he, he called it later. So all was, and he gave it using the Vedantic tradition. Mm -hmm. The first experience he had, he called it the, the passive Brahman. Mm. Brahman which is passive. And then the second experience he had where he saw that everything is really a form of the Brahman. Uh -huh. He called it the active Brahman. Now, let's define Brahman uh, yeah. for our viewers who may not be familiar with that term. It gets confusing because there's Brahma and yes. Brahman. Yes. Brahman is a term that comes to us from the Upanishads. Mm -hmm. And it's the term they use for reality as the only conscious thing there is. It's a, it's a kind of a universal and transcendental consciousness, mm -hmm. which is the only reality. Everything mm -hmm. else that we may talk about, like the creatures, the objects, uh, all these uh, cosmic realities mm -hmm. are all forms of Brahman. There is nothing else than Brahman. That, mm -hmm. That's the Vedantic term. Okay. So for him, there was an aspect of Brahman to which everything that we see was only illusionary. It was only observed as a, as a projection. Mm -hmm. So it was passive. The Brahman was passive. Mm -hmm. in, in other words, Brahman is, is the ultimate observer but not necessarily active in the world the way uh, Shakti is considered right, to be an right. active 
powerful force. Powerful force. But then it is it is also the primary substance that has modulated itself into all the forms of the cosmos. Mm -hmm. So that's where it becomes active. It's, it has become active due to the power of Shakti mm -hmm. that has given it forms. And this is more or less traditional Vedantic thinking. This is thinking. traditional Vedantic thinking. But whereas many schools uh, affirmed only the passive Brahman and many schools affirmed only the active Brahman, Brahman, he was saying that they are both realities, they're, they're both true. Mm -hmm. And then he was to have a third very major realization, which is that imminent in every being and every uh, entity in the universe, uh, there was th this supreme dimension, the third, di the fourth dimension, if you want to call it that, okay. was present as a being in everybody. Mm -hmm. And this is a theistic kind of experience, and he was not a very theistic person. But by then, uh, he was receiving some kind of intimations from mm -hmm. uh, a god, I mean, the, the Brahman as a person. Mm -hmm. And he was to see that person as Krishna. Mm -hmm. So in this third very important experience, he was to see, uh, he was in the prison, and he was to see that everybody was Krishna. Uh, the judge was Krishna playing judge. Uh, the prosecuting counsel was Krishna playing, playing the jury was Krishna as mm -hmm. jury. So he had this experience and it, it followed him so that even inanimate objects like the walls of the prison, the grating, the tree outside, he saw them all as Krishna. And so this was a third very major, and it, you know, he used his understanding his, his highly developed philosophical mind to think of these as three dimensions of, mm -hmm. of, uh, 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 of reality. So here we have a man who began his adult career as a political revolutionary, even a terrorist, yes. coming to the realization that uh, w where he really wanted to uh, evolved towards is, is a spiritual revolutionary. Quite true, quite true. And he, he talks about it in those terms later. Mm -hmm. He says, uh, what, what, we're, uh, what I'm attempting is a, not a revolution against the, the British crown, uh, which is necessary, mm -hmm. but also more primarily a revolution against the whole economy of nature as it exists right now. So mm -hmm. he wanted to transform the condition of suffering and ignorance mm -hmm. uh, using these uh, perceptions and powers that uh, came to him through yoga. Mm -hmm. And I suppose it's fair to note that at the same time, other people like Freud and yes. Western civilization are also attempting some sort of a, a psychic liberation of... Yeah. Uh, Absolutely. And, and Karl Marx is also talking about political mm -hmm. revolution yes. in, in the same era. And Einstein is developing whole new vistas in the field of physics. Yes, yes, yes. It's, it's, a, it's a time of revolution. So in a way, I think modernity as a revolution uh, at the turn of the century has to be studied in that way, as you just mentioned, uh, where we actually find that even in colonies and uh, non-Western regions, a similar aspiration was being turned into ideas mm -hmm. uh, by natives. Uh, that also were trying to engage with these problems of, of humanity. Yeah, and and I imagine that there is some tendency amongst the British to kind of look down on on a colonized people uh, yeah. such as the, those in India. Not mm -hmm. necessarily for the average Brit to mm -hmm. appreciate that these people come from a very ancient culture. Right. Right. Probably older. Than, mm. than the Anglo-Saxon culture of uh, England. Yes, yes. With, with a very evolved philosophy. Yes, quite right. And he was bringing all his modern understanding to bear mm -hmm. on, on, on the past. And I'd like to mention one other important experience he had during that period. 
and that was he claims that the astral body of Vivekananda came to him in the jail mm -hmm. and showed him planes of mind uh, above the human mind. Vivekananda being a very famous yogi who visited the West and quite right, uh, yeah. attracted enormous amount of attention in the United States from leading intellectuals and, and psychologists mm -hmm. like William James. Yes. And so he was he was saying, I think this is one of the revolutionary uh, ideas that Aurobindo presents that uh, the human evolution is not yet complete, that we've uh, explored realms of mentality. See, even the animal has a mind, mm -hmm. but it doesn't have enough rationality. Mm -hmm. We have a much more full-blown rational capacity mm -hmm. than animals, uh, non-human animals. But there are other capacities of the mind that mm -hmm. we haven't yet uh, explored. This is a very important part of Aurobindo's thinking that exactly. we'll, we'll develop further sure, in sure. some of our future interviews. But sure. I want to make one point clear in yes. case our viewers missed it. Vivekananda had already died by the time Aurobindo had experienced this vision. Yes, Vivekananda died in 1902. And this uh, experience was had in 1908-09, in that time period. And so it was his astral body that he claims came to him. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, Aurobindo was like a scientist. He, was he, he really tested every premise that he declared. So for a while, he uh, even doubted the fact. He, he, he played with the idea that it might have been a projection of his own mind. Mm -hmm. But uh, he came to believe towards the end, I mean, later life, mm -hmm. that he actually was visited by Vivekananda. Well, this is a very important point uh, because I know Aurobindo explored the paranormal in a rigorous yes. manner. And yes. um, fortunately, we have two more interviews to go into greater depth about the philosophy and the integral yoga psychology that Aurobindo developed. But our time has run out for now, so thank you so much for this half hour, Devashish. Thank you, Jeffrey. And thank you for being with us. Be sure to check your listings for part two of our three-part series on the integral yoga philosophy of Sri Aurobindo. Thank you.